Hello, everyone. My name is Chantal Autre. I am the Communications Officer at the Partnership for Economic Policy. On behalf of the on behalf of the PEP team, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to briefly share some housekeeping points. We have French and English interpretation available. To listen in your preferred language, click Interpretation at the bottom of your screen and select the language you wish to hear. There will be a Q&A and open discussion period following the panel discussion. You can communicate your questions anytime during the event by using the Q&A space, which you can access by clicking on Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You may also share your questions and comments in the collective chat space, but, there, but these may be missed and therefore not addressed. If relevant, please identify the person that your question is intended for. Also, make sure that your name appears correctly with your profile. We require all participants to remain courteous and on topic throughout the event. Please be aware that we are recording this event and may share it on our YouTube channel and website. I now hand over to Jane Mariera, Executive Director of the Partnership for Economic Policy. Wait, Jane, we can't hear you. We, we, we cannot hear your sound. Um, no, we can't hear you. Perhaps, uh, Bakar, you may want to. Uh, yes, please. Up. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, let me start by welcoming, uh, colleagues, attendees uh, for this PEP International uh, Policy Conference and increasing participation of Southern researchers in development economics policy and uh, debates. Uh, I have the honor of introducing uh, three very distinguished panelists uh, who have very kindly uh, taken out time to educate us and uh, provide their reflections on this uh, subject. Uh, First, we have Dr. Rose uh, Nagogi, who is the Executive Director of Kenya Institute of Public Policy Research and Analysis, a very prestigious think tank. She provides policy guidance and strategy, strategy formulation uh, uh, to the government of Kenya. Previously, she, she served as Senior Advisor at the IMF and was part of the Central Bank of Kenya's Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, she has taught at University of Nairobi School of Economics and has published widely. We are also uh, joined here by Dr. Rohinton uh, Madhura, who is distinguished fellow and former president of the Center for International uh, Governance Innovation. He is a member of a PEP board of directors and previously served as vice president of programs at Canada's International Development Research Center. Uh, his expertise is in international economics and the governance of new technologies. He continues to remain involved with several global commissions and advisory boards, uh, including the Lancet, uh, the, the Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures, and the Commission on Econ Global Economic Transformation. Uh, our final panelist is Dr. Uh, Santiago Levy, who's also a board member of uh, PEP, uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow uh, with the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. Some of his past roles include Vice President of Sectors and Knowledge at the Inter-American Development Bank, President of the Federal Competition Commission and Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Finance and Public Credit of Mexico, uh, where he has led and contributed to the design of several major uh, programs and legislations. Dr. Levy has also published extensively and won numerous awards for his 
uh, research. Um, you know, with this brief introduction of our panelists, let me quickly turn uh, to the concept which has brought us together. Uh, as most of you may have seen on the web page that was generated for inviting you to this discussion, and I see many of our colleagues who have worked in this area as well, uh, we now understand that Southern researchers, and particularly the female Southern researchers, are, are generally underrepresented in these uh, development economics debates, and are usually uh, marginalized from the global uh, policy debates. Uh, we have a PEP study, uh, which finds that less than 10% of authors of uh, the World Bank and UNDP flagship reports until 2020 uh, reside in the developing countries. So this is less than 10%. And, and this was probably the main objective of this policy conference, to identify and discuss concrete actions to, uh, concrete actions to increase Southern participation uh, and female participation in particular in global development policy debates. Uh, I would also be inviting you and a share will, a, a link will also be shared on this. Uh, I would be inviting you to the PEP call to action, uh, which uh, some of you may have already seen. Uh, this has really laid down uh, an agenda to increase the sudden participation. We focus on how sudden participation can be increased in, in research which is coming out and should have uh, interventions or submissions from people who are living in these countries. Research should be sourced uh, from the invisible countries as we call them. Uh, we also note the participation in development journals and how they need to recognize the value and contribution of local expertise and socio-cultural context. Uh, we have also advocated uh, a move to more open access uh, uh, to these journals, to the leading journals. For research networks, the PEP call to action advocates for, advocates for increasing South-North research partnerships. And for development conferences, PEP call to action calls for uh, leading conferences and webinars, uh, which should include researchers based in the southern countries who can better represent uh, uh, which policies are a better fit for them. And then finally, when it comes to research funding, uh, the, 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 the increase in funding which is required to really uh, invite contribution of local researcher is local researchers is also touched upon in the PEP uh, call to uh, action. Um, with this in mind, uh, let me also uh, uh, just give a structure to today's discussion. And uh, we will be uh, posing uh, two sets of questions to our very distinguished panel, and they will have uh, five to seven minutes uh, for responding to the first question. And then of course, again, five to seven minutes to respond to the second uh, question, which will be posed by my fellow uh, moderator, Anna. Uh, and we will then of course, move over to your uh, questions, comments, which you are free, uh, you're, you're free to post uh, in, in, in the designated uh, space here. Uh, and then we will have a good half an hour, a little over half an hour uh, to engage based upon the questions that you post uh, in, in, in the designated uh, chat space. Uh, uh, with this, I quickly move to uh, the, the, the first question uh, that I want to set out in front of our panel. And the first question which we had given to them and requested their inputs uh, was that uh, how do they feel uh, uh, that Southern thinkers, especially females, uh, they are underrepresented. Uh, they are underrepresented in their experience of development policy making. Uh, they have been part of data uh, or evidence that may actually demonstrate this. Uh, and we also want to ask, as a subset to this question, uh, if Southern researchers provide new or different perspectives or insights compared to, for example, the Northern counterparts uh, as per their uh, experience. Uh, now, I do understand that uh, uh, Santiago was constrained on time. So let me just uh, open uh, uh, with Santiago first uh, and then move to our other panelists. Santiago, it's over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Bagar, and good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, wherever people are. Uh, let me first begin by congratulating Jane and, and all her team at PEP uh, for all the research that has gone into this uh, panel discussion today. 
But really what is very valuable is all the research that John and the team led. I think Anna participated, Vagar participated. There was a paper that came out of it with very, very interesting data. And I think you guys have uh, put together a really important development issue on the table. So congratulations for that. Um, so to turn to your question, uh, Vagar, um, I, I think what we need to have here is a little bit more of a regional perspective because I think the north-south divide is central, but then within the south, there are regional perspectives. And I will speak a little bit from my own Latin American perspective, which might not be the same as perhaps Rose's perspective from Africa, or perhaps Rohington has a different regional perspective. Um, so let me first make a distinction between southern participation in policy debates and Southern participation in academic publications. They're not the same thing. Um, in my experience in Latin America, Southern participation in policy debates has been very intense for the last two decades. Um, that's different from participation in academic journals and academic publications. But if you think about the debate going on at the national level between the planning ministries, the finance ministries, the various uh, health pension ministries, the central bank, these are mostly populated by national people who engage in very intense debate. There's also intense debate within the universities of these countries. And there's also important debate between these universities and local governments and if you want to use some expression, the Washington-based institutions, uh, to say the IMF, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the International Development Community in the United Nations, UNDP, and sort of roughly put them all to the ball of the Washington-based institution. I think over the years, the Washington-based institutions have made an effort, not enough, and I think this is a line of work that PEP can pursue in the future, but they have made an effort at least in Latin America, to involve Latin American researchers in the production of your flag, in their flagships, and in the production of their own research. Uh, as, as Vagar mentioned, I was vice president of the Inter-American Development Bank for 10 years, and I led 10 flagship reports. Every single report was put together by calling on researchers from Latin America and explicitly making calls for papers and gatherings in which Latin American people would participate. The final writing of the report itself, the report itself will be an Inter-American Development Bank report. And so you might think of it as a Washington-based report. But the inputs, the, the, the research that went into the report was very much with the participation of people from all of Latin America. And I think there's some suggestion here looking constructively forward that PEP can pursue, which is I think the multilateral development banks can really and should outsource a lot more of their research to the South. And there I come, Bagar, to one point that you made. I think Bagar, the South does have a comparative advantage in certain dimensions because the econometric techniques and the mathematical techniques and the statistics techniques to, carry, to, to do research are well known throughout. And you know, we can consult them in, in the internet and we can always talk to a colleague what the researchers from the South bring to the table, which is really very important, is the local context, the local nuance, the local institutions. In my own work, I sometimes find papers produced on Mexico by people who had never had a foot on Mexico, and the papers are technically very competent, but they miss the big point. <laughs> they miss the big point because they don't understand the institutions, they don't understand the local context. So yes, I think there's a lot to be brought to the table. And I think that Washington-based institutions now understand that they really need to capture the nuances of the political context of each individual country if their policy prescriptions are going to be useful. And that one size does not fit all, and that you really have to have local knowledge, and this local knowledge can certainly put forth by Southern researchers. So this is, I think, where PEP has identified a really valuable issue and let me now turn and close by saying, in turn, this can open the door to more Southern participation in academic publications, of which I made a difference from policy debates. 
academic publications in general, that's my personal subjective view, have a little bit of a bias in terms of the novelty of the statistical technique and the novelty of the econometrics of it. Uh, a little bit of show off in terms of, you know, who can do more bootstrapping and who can do more this and that and regression discontinuity and whatnot. But gradually, probably this uh, fashion will fade away and we will understand better from an academic point of view that to make relevant research, the local knowledge is essential. It's as essential as the econometric technique that is being put into it. And yes, there are data limitations because the data, is, the data is not as good as we would like to be, but this is continuously improving. And I think that a door can be open. Let me close by saying, I think one thing that PEP is doing uh, from the research that you put together throughout the past year, which is to talk to the editors of the academic journals is very valuable. They might not be aware of their biases. There might be some inertia, this academic inertia, but I think if PEP brings up, look, we're missing out, we're not producing academic knowledge of as quality as it could be because we're not drawing upon this all side of research that is being so valued. This is something that I think would actually increase the participation in academic publications. So let me stop there and I'm happy to come back for a second round uh, and, and thank you, Vagar. Thank you, uh, Santiago, and I think uh, you have kicked us off with this very important distinction that we need to make in our analysis regarding a Southern participation policy debates versus uh, the participation in economic uh, uh, development academic journals, uh, including uh, the engagement with editors of these journals, uh, which I'm sure that uh, PEP continues to do, and certainly this is an area where further effort can be stepped up in the coming day coming days. So I take uh, the same question now to Rose. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, happy to be here and uh, to give my perspectives uh, on the first uh, question. And I'll start by saying that um, uh, there are various uh, uh, platforms that one uh, can see uh, Southern thinkers uh, uh, engaging in, uh, in the development policy uh, making uh, uh, platforms. And um, uh, I'm going to look at it uh, uh, from uh, even the structures of, of a government because uh, I work with a government. So I'm going to, to look at that perspective, yeah? And just start by saying that uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, that, uh, for example, recently I've seen uh, one former CEO of uh, a think tank in Tanzania uh, being uh, appointed as a as a PS, uh, um, as a PS, which means that uh, uh, this helps in terms of uh, uh, probably uh, um, making a difference as far as the uh, policy making process is concerned and bringing also uh, the experience that one has uh, uh, from uh, being an evidence uh, generator. I, I also want to uh, uh, look at uh, uh, where the platforms, for example, you find uh, uh, female, uh, which can give you a perspective whether as female thinkers, we are actually uh, being uh, 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 participat participatory in this process. And I've looked at uh, the UN agencies, there are about 15 of them. And I've asked myself, uh, what is the representation of uh, the lead, uh, leadership in them uh, as far as the gender aspect is concerned? And I realized that uh, very good gender, 50%, uh, almost 50% of all the agencies have actually um, are, are led by females. But when you look at the Southerners, then what you find is that it's only 25%, only about two of the, the agencies are led by, by, by Southerners, um, which means that uh, we may be missing out uh, from this platform as far as the uh, 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 development uh, agenda and the uh, debate is actually uh, concerned. And then I looked at uh, in Africa, uh, who, wh how many, the number of presidents that we have uh, who are female. And uh, I found that uh, uh, currently we only have two female uh, presidents, one in uh, Tanzania and another one in Ethiopia. 
a good, very good channel, uh, which you can think of uh, uh, involving and uh, seeing the, the female uh, angle of uh, uh, participating in development uh, uh, agenda. Uh, and then when I come back home, I ask myself, uh, is there uh, a representation at the government level? Uh, we, have, uh, we have counties. And this time round, uh, uh, the governors that we have elected, there are now uh, seven of them. It means that they make about 14.9% of all the female uh, governors that have been uh, 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 elected this year of the 47 counties. Again, uh, showing a growth over time uh, since uh, the devolution process uh, started in Kenya. I'm bringing all this because uh, we need to understand the platforms within which uh, we should see uh, uh, these conversations uh, happening. Now, coming to uh, uh, um, a, think tank, a think tank like Kipra, I would say when we were uh, being uh, uh, formed uh, in 1997, one of the key things that the government was looking for is, uh, can we have um, an institution that is able to run around uh, uh, giving evidence while the public servant is, uh, is sitting down to do the day-to-day -day activities. There were very few uh, think tanks then, and the very few consultancy uh, uh, institutions who are not necessarily focusing themselves on public policy. So uh, Kipra then came in to fill in that gap. And uh, what is it that uh, we have seen happening? Uh, one uh, is that uh, we are able to engage with the government because uh, statutorily, uh, we are expected to produce a flagship report called the Kenya Economic Report, which we have been producing since uh, uh, 20, uh, 2009. And this report is expected to be tabled in parliament, which means that as an institution, we are able to engage uh, very closely with the policy makers in, in the various arms of, of government. But over time, we have also seen ourselves uh, uh, interacting, uh, for example, with the, uh, the British Wood institutions. Uh, I've heard what Levy has said. And how have we input, how have we managed to uh, work together? What we have worked together is, for example, in their investment climate uh, surveys. They come to Kipra and they say, we are undertaking this survey. Uh, do you have some perspective from the local uh, that we can uh, actually put in uh, such that uh, the data that comes from the field is uh, reflective of what is happening in Kenya. And later on, when you are doing your own analysis, you are able actually to reflect on what is uh, on the ground. Um, uh, that aside, uh, I would say that uh, um, in, in terms of a uh, uh, relationship between uh, uh, academic and the policymaker, it has been a little bit uh, uh, not very smooth. And so as an institution, what we have done is uh, to say, let's have a mentorship program that helps um, uh, academic to understand the development agenda of the government and to make their work relevant to the development uh, uh, process. So we have uh, sessions, events that we do with the universities and we discuss uh, uh, the development agenda that the government uh, is uh, uh, prioritizing. So um, I have checked and uh, tried to ask myself, is there data uh, that can tell you what is going on and the, the role of the female think tanker in, uh, in the Southern? And I've realized that there is very little. Uh, UN uh, Women uh, is trying to carry out uh, some surveys, but this is only with women leadership and political participation data. But I've seen also that there is a report uh, that is being produced by the uh, European Union for just the European countries that is actually focusing on the gender equality as far as uh, uh, um, um, uh, the, the publication element uh, is concerned. So um, uh, to, 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 to bring it uh, uh, to a conclusion, I would say that uh, as Southern Voice, uh, what I've seen is that uh, 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 providing um, a platform for engagement uh, makes it uh, uh, crucial in having think tanks uh, actually talk to each other, as well as share a platform where they can exchange views. Uh, and with, this, with the exchange of these views, we are able to learn from each other and to educate each other on uh, uh, what is happening uh, back home in where we are coming from. Let me stop there. I'll come back uh, the next uh, round. 
Thank you, uh, Rose. And uh, uh, thank you for highlighting the importance of platforms and networks. And uh, I think uh, certainly networks uh, end up uh, uh, putting together coalitions, which then advocate uh, for change uh, together and with collective wisdom, you know. Uh, and thank you also for uh, bringing in the example from uh, Kepra, where of course you are able to uh, put a homegrown knowledge document right uh, in the parliament for your uh, legislature, you know. Uh, and I think uh, if I'm hearing correctly, you also advocate that more data and evidence uh, uh, is required, uh, uh, which can certainly help augment the case going forward uh, for uh, sudden uh, participation. Again, a gap which uh, uh, Pep has tried to bridge here. Uh, let me now move to Rohinton for his uh, interventions, please. Vakar, thank you. And thank you to all of you at Pep for organizing. Uh, I joined my co-panelists in saying in organizing this discussion on this very timely and pertinent topic. Um, I'd, I'd like to sort of pick up where both uh, Santiago and Rose uh, left off, as it were, but, but also to underline really all of the things they said. And I'd start with, uh, Rakar, your, your last sub-question, um, which was something like, you know, how do we in, increase the participation of Southern researchers in, in policy debates? And Santiago's comment about how, when he was vice president at the IDB and he stewarded several flagship reports, and although they were IDB reports, he felt compelled to bring in uh, varied perspectives and seek them out. And it's a very obvious point, but I think it's worth making that people matter. Uh, having people like Santiago and having people like Rose in thought leadership positions and in positions of influence can make all the difference. And especially in large institutions that have inertia and that are often driven as the IFIs are by uh, political considerations, having the right people actually get it is important. And so, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's something about that which I'll come back to. Then we get to the question of, um, is this an issue? And I notice in the chat function, someone's already asked, uh, could you please explain what, what a Southern voice is or what a Southern researcher is? And I think that's a very important comment. Uh, the reason I say that is, I don't think the core question is your nationality or residence. Although I totally, totally take Santiago's point about how um, being embedded in local situations matters. But I don't think that's the only question. Um, I think what really matters is, are we open to diverse viewpoints or are we in a tunnel vision mode? Uh, the IFIs, by the way, are full of developing country nationals who are just frankly um, happy to be there. And many of them often are more Catholic than the Pope in, in how they advocate. So it's not nationality, it's that openness to varied views. And so that brings me to my sort of third point, which is when we talk about influence in policy and research, uh, we can't be doing this on our own. We're all part of our own environments. And there are two environments that matter for the purposes of our discussion here. One is the national environment, and the other is our professional environment as economists. Both of those, we know from lots of evidence, have often issues with representation, with voice, with variety. And so we cannot necessarily push against a string, but if we want to get at this, we have to work at these two levels. Uh, the economics profession is undergoing a bit of a retrospection. Uh, the American Economics Association, its European counterpart, Rose mentioned uh, the, the initiative her content is doing, are actually taking a hard look at whether the profession is gender friendly or variety friendly. I'm associated with something called the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which was created 12 years ago exactly because the financial crisis was seen as not just the crisis of people or institutions, but actually a crisis for the discipline of economics. We had got too hung up on technique, too hung up 
on certain ways of seeing markets and not others. And that kind of led to this infallibility uh, syndrome, which then came crashing down on us. And so as economists, we have to broaden the space of the, 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 sort of the reward function under which economists operate. In universities, I think we have to work strongly against the publisher terror syndrome, which in the old days used to be restricted to North American universities and a few European universities. And now I find that universities in developing countries, so to show that they've made it, actually buy into that model and demand of their faculty that same kind of rigid publish in these journals or you won't get the points approach. So I think there's a lot to do at the economics profession level. Is it open to new ideas? Is it open to younger researchers? Is it open to women and marginalized research to the extent that we would like it to be? So that's on the professional side. On the national policy side, I, I absolutely take the points that Santiago and uh, Rose have made. Uh, I think national discussions often reflect national political economy, national culture. And if it is of a certain kind, then what can we do? One sort of relatively uh, different thought on that one. I think we should think more carefully about the civil service structure. And I've, I've sort of experienced both, but in the, in the sort of Westminster model, you have a permanent civil service. And so you rise through the ranks. There are very few people who come from the outside. And then in the US and to some extent the Latin American model, you don't have that permanent civil service. You have almost wholesale shifts in senior positions when new administrations come in. Um, in each case, I think there are pros and cons that can be made for the model, but then apply that to how it affects the question we're facing in this panel. And I'd say, unless you have a very strong proactive government, and currently in Canada, by the way, although we have a permanent civil service, we have a government that's exceptional. Some people might say, too strong on this one, uh, who actively promote over the heads of the established hierarchy, uh, women or visible minorities or, or whatever that kind of um, bandwidth uh, uh, is specified to be. It's more difficult in the permanent civil service structure. I think when you have more fluidity in the civil service, uh, there's other problems. Sometimes you have no continuity whatsoever, but it does leave open national public opinion and committed governments to make a difference slightly more quickly. Um, last point I'd make on this all is that uh, since we talked about the IFIs uh, and the journals as, as being two, two uh, special cases here, I fully support the view that uh, we as a community, uh, perhaps through a spearheaded by that, should reach out to the major economics journals, not just the development economics journals, uh, engage the managing editors and actually create a community which I don't think exists to show why it's important and how it could be done. And in the IFIs, I come back to my first point that it's the people. And I think we all have um, through our representation there, avenues to enter and to make the difference but ultimately recognize that the way forward there is going to be to change the governance structure of the IFIs uh, more than anything else. That's a long-term goal. It's one that can be slowly but surely achieved, but it's one worth going for. Thank you, uh, uh, Rohinton. I think you make a very important point uh, when you say that thought leaders uh, have to be, thought leaders from the South have to be in multilateral institutions, in IFIs, uh, especially to address the inertia which some of these institutions may be facing. Uh, I think uh, you also invite us to take a step back and actually see if economics as a profession uh, is more open to marginalized voices. And within that subset, I think the fact that uh, for many of us, even the mapping of these marginalized voices uh, isn't complete. Uh, and there may be so many groups 
uh, of, of uh, the marginalized segments whose voices have been missed out from the policy debates, from the academic journals, and, and uh, the, the, their presence in the institutions uh, of international importance, as you uh, point out. Uh, with this, I think, as I uh, pick up and collect uh, some of the questions uh, for which I really invite our attendees to post their questions now, uh, maybe I can now request uh, my co-moderator, uh, Anna, to, uh, to, to, to go forward with the second question uh, and engage with our uh, panel. Uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you, Vakar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. It's very exciting uh, discussion, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, before formulating the next question, I would like to remind you of two important cases of women leadership. Uh, the first one is related to COVID-19 pandemic. And probably everyone will remember that right in the beginning of the pandemic, when there were lots of uncertainties, the media showed that in some countries, there were a very fast, creative, and efficient response to COVID-19. From the use of social media, the use of TV, COVID testing, and lockdowns, lots of lives were saved. And what these countries that had a very important response and fast response right in the beginning had in common, and I can cite here, Taiwan, New Zealand, Norway, Finland, Germany, Iceland, and others. What they had in common was the women leadership. They were all led by women. Another uh, point here that I would like uh, to, to discuss with you is the, the, the conditional cash transfer programs that probably everyone knows about it. Uh, it's, they, they were two largest and pioneering programs in the world. Uh, Santiago Levy knows very well about this. One of them is in Mexico, Progresa, Oportunidades or Prospera. And the other one in Brazil, they started the conditional cash transfers programs in the world and was called Bolsa Familia. Uh, and every month governments transferred income to poor families. And these stipends were paid to the woman in the household. Why they pay to women and not to men? Because uh, there are many research showing that women better allocate resources for the well being of their family. They invest in children's education, health, nutrition, and so on. So, that said, my question is can you identify the main obstacles that may explain? lower participation of Southern researchers, researchers and especially females in policy, which concrete actions can be undertaken in order to improve the situation? Can we start with uh, Dr. Santiago, please? Sure. Thank you, Anna. Um, so again, my distinction between participation in policy debate and participation in academic publications. Uh, I think Rohington made a really important point in his previous intervention that even in the US, there is now awareness that in academic publications, women have been discriminated against. So this is not a Southern Northern issue. This is a broader issue that the economics profession as a whole has been, I don't know what the word is, discrimination, unfair, not given equal treatment to women and to men. There's papers about this even published in, in the US, in US academia. So this is a big world issue, so to speak. This is a North, not a North-South issue. Um, and this first, being aware of it is very important. Then doing something about it is very important. And I think there are ways in which journal editors can do this by making it sex blind or by whatever techniques they use, but certainly this can be improved. But I would not put this as part of something that PEP would like to do because this, this is not PEP's comparative advantage. This is an, a, an issue north-south. Where I think PEP does have a comparative advantage is in the policy debate and, and in the area in which now you can say, look, for certain things, the perspective of having empowerment of women 
makes a substantive difference. You did mention the conditional cash transfer programs. There, the evidence was pretty clear. Women internalize more than men the health and education of their children for whatever reasons. So therefore, if you transfer resources to women, actually the effectiveness of the program will be greater and this will be better intergeneration. Does this carry over to other areas? Probably yes, probably for education and probably for other areas of policy. So what can PEP do here? I think PEP can be well, exercise a lot of leadership in terms of affirmative action. In all the projects that PEP engages, make sure that there's gender balance. In the dialogue that is carried out between PEP and government, make sure that there's gender balance and try to use whatever resources, PEP, and we all wish he had more, to actually give more fellowship, more resources, and more space for production of academic work. Let me just make a little window into Latin America again, which is the part of the world that I know best. There's some excellent, top of the line, female researchers. And in some areas, they're ahead. So it's a matter of just opening the spaces, and once these spaces are over, then the ball gets rolling and it becomes very natural. If I compare the participation of women to the participation of women, say, 30 years ago, and I've been in this, in this area for a long time now, um, it's day and night. It's day and night. Now, the speed of change can be accelerated if we are proactive and if we are aware. And so being very concrete and being very constructive, I think PEP can, in its policy dialogue with IFIs, with the Washington institutions, with the national governments would engage, or when they partner with other institutions, have all these affirmative actions, all these mechanisms to ensure that there's gender balance and that the opportunities for women to participate in the policy debates are as broad as they can be. And I will actually not, to repeat, not use PEP resources to worry about the academic publication issue because that's a broader issue. That's not a north-south issue. It's more of a world issue. Uh, let me stop here, Anna. Thank you so much, Santiago. Yeah, it's very important. The, your comments uh, on PEP tasks, on PEP uh, ways of improving the opportunities for women to participate and affirm affirmative actions and gender balance. And I think that's the the main goal of PEP right now. Thank you so much. Uh, let me continue with uh, Rose, please. Rose, your answer. Yeah, uh, okay. Thanks very much, Anna, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I want to carry on the, the discussion um, uh, from, again, uh, the interaction uh, that one would have uh, between uh, uh, southern thinkers and the uh, policy makers. And in some, some situations, you may find that uh, uh, it doesn't, the gender aspect may not, uh, may, may actually not be uh, uh, an element, uh, but sometimes it is uh, whether the channels for engagement actually uh, exist. Um, I'll tell you, for example, we have, um, a, as an institution, uh, uh, come up with a, a platform for a Kenya think, think Tank. We call it Kenya Think Tank Forum. And the first time we had a conversation with the policymakers, especially from uh, uh, parliament, uh, we were able to uh, realize that uh, in parliament, uh, in Kenya, they have uh, what they call a caucus uh, on evidence informed the uh, policy making process. Now, before then, we actually didn't know uh, what are the channels uh, that one can use actually to make uh, impact to be impactful uh, in the in the policy uh, process. So, um, networking and having platforms uh, that can facilitate uh, engagement with the policy makers, I think, is very very crucial for uh, southern thinkers to not only uh, uh, do the evidencing, but also to ensure that uh, uh, they are doing it uh, uh, impactively. Uh, I think that is the, the first thing I want to say. The second thing we realized uh, was that uh, the way we package our products uh, matters a lot. Uh, in some situations, uh, you may notice that uh, 
uh, we look, our products are not policy oriented, but they look more academic. But for policymaker, uh, what they are looking for is uh, a policy paper that they can digest very fast. Uh, yes, you could have very uh, fancy uh, methodology, but the question is uh, where, uh, what kind of message are you giving uh, to the policymaker? Are you having policy briefs? Are you having uh, uh, other uh, infographic kind of uh, 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 publication that can easily give me uh, the information I'm looking for now and very quickly and not uh, reading a 50 page uh, a document. I want to read something very small, uh, very fast. But the other element also is the timing. Uh, yes, uh, sometimes, uh, and I'm happy that Anna was bringing in the aspect of uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, as an institution, what we found ourselves was that the demand was heavy. So you have all the policymakers, they are coming and they want you to tell them, so what's going on? What is the uh, expected impact of all this and the like? If you don't have a very good tools for analysis uh, uh, with very good uh, frameworks that can give uh, either good simulations or they can give very good focusing, then you may find yourself being left out uh, of the debate because uh, you're not making an input into the same. So uh, having good tools makes it uh, very, very, very critical. And then finally, also to say that um, uh, sometimes Southern thinkers uh, uh, find themselves in a situation where, you know, data, quality of data, uh, uh, data that is uh, available uh, in a frequency that, that you'd want to, to have, uh, is also a problem. So you find therefore that you are restricted uh, sometimes in terms of the analysis that uh, you may want to do. And uh, I think it's high time also, for example, even for PEP to think about um, uh, what kind of databases uh, uh, they would actually subscribe to or build up uh, such that uh, researchers uh, uh, have it easy in terms of uh, uh, the information that they are getting uh, uh, for analysis. I want to stop there at the moment here. Thank you so much, Rose. Yes, it's very important what you said about networking, empowerment, uh, policy papers versus academic paper. This is something I've learned a lot in PEP. PEP has this flag of translating the academic journals and, and, and research. This is really very important. It's small, easy, without all the methodologies, just what the policymakers really want. And of course, data. The data is very important. We need to, to improve the quality of data, mainly in poor countries and, and, and developing countries. Thank you so much. Uh, let's continue. Please, Dr. Marihura. Um, you know, Anna, um, quality of data is the great equalizer. Uh, if there's poor data, um, whether you're, you know, uh, man, woman, marginalized from the north or the south, your research is going to be equally shoddy. And so we, so I'm all for improving data quality, but we also have to understand that for any given level of data quality, there's a hierarchy, and that's what we're discussing today, and that using poor data some economists tend to be more influential than others, or some institutions tend to be more influential than others. Um, and, and, and so improving the data without doing anything about the hierarchy will not get us there. Actually, um, I'd encourage a recent issue of the New Yorker has a very good profile of the UMass economist, uh, Isabella Weber. And I'd really encourage all of you to read it because it's a profile that's of outlines, although it was not written for that, uh, many of the issues we're talking about. And, and the short story is this. Um, uh, she's an economist at UMass, uh, off the mainstream, one might say. And she's been writing about price controls and wage controls for some time and being pilloried for it. In fact, she'd written a column in The Guardian some two, three years ago and was roundly attacked by other public intellectuals for being you know, wrong about policy, wrong about economics, and so on. But the fact is, she's a very good economic historian. 
She had her facts straight on when is it that price and wage controls work, when they don't. So each time she was attacked, uh, yes, she went through, as the article describes, a period in which she withdrew onto herself and was questioning her professional value. But she kept doing rigorous work. Uh, and the point about being attacked by famous people is you're then noticed. So that's one lesson. Second lesson, if you have the facts on your side and if you persist, you will not be wrong in the long run. Third lesson, and this is sort of one of the things that Rose said about timing, um, what happened? Uh, the Ukraine war began, and the Biden administration took industrial policy very seriously. Global events that Professor Weber had nothing to do with changed the context within which her ideas were being seen. And she's now actually a celebrity economist and appears on Bloomberg TV. So, you know, persistence in the face of unreasonable attacks, which is often difficult to ask of human beings, is something that really matters. Having media channels matters. Um, you know, yes, if you write in The Guardian, people will say, ah, that's just, you know, the left of center Guardian saying its things. But having the social media and other connections garners you visibility, which we did not have a generation ago. And finally, be ready to seize the moment when the moment happens. When the Ukraine invasion happened, when Biden's legislation made market interventions fashionable again, we have a sort of host of economists who are now much more influential. Doesn't matter whether they're man, woman, north, south. It's just that broadening the bandwidth of the economic space that I'm trying to emphasize here that makes a difference. In addition to that, all the things I think that I and we said in the first round uh, is still important. Engage with the journals. Find ways to uh, change the incentive system within universities, especially in developing countries, and on and on and on. So I think there's a series of things we can be doing. I noticed in the chat, and, and Santiago mentioned it too, research funding agencies have an important role to play, and that's good. By the way, science funding research in, uh, agencies have made it a condition in many cases of their funds that the research must be published in open access journals. And that's made a huge difference in the way research is published and disseminated. One might think of equivalence in the development economics research space where we condition, and I know we have a colleague from GDN also online who's, who says what Pep says, that when we condition our grants in a way that they bring in these other characteristics, then you change the incentive structure. And if there's one thing economists understand, it's incentive structure. Thank you so much. Yes, you are totally right. Data is important, but sometimes it's available just for some and not all. And this is something really, really have to, to deal with, yes. Uh, of course, social media and all the media and all everything we have available right now will help a lot. And we need to be aware of that. Thank you so much. Uh, since we are with some time left, we I'm, I'm going to ask Bakar to start with the debates and, and read the questions that we have already here in the Q&A. And please, everybody, can ask questions if you wish. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Anna. And I wanted to start with uh, probably uh, two very broad questions. You know, uh, uh, we have one by uh, probably the first question by William Spence, uh, who asks that to what extent is the current increase in developing country power and negotiation position in a multipolar global power structure contributing to uh, Southern influence uh, in policy debates and policy making. Uh, and perhaps a question related to this, uh, but maybe uh, uh, focusing more uh, inward at, at, a, at a developing country level where uh, Lambert uh, Iniza uh, has highlighted that you have countries who may not have frameworks or who may not actually allow 
uh, such uh, collaboration very freely uh, to take place, you know, uh, which actually reminds me of, uh, of the power that, for example, multilateral institutions uh, can exercise uh, in bringing about such a framework for the Southern uh, researchers. Uh, I think uh, uh, Anisa's point is also related to how the political leadership in developing countries also needs to be convinced that uh, the best advice doesn't necessarily uh, comes from the North. You know, it could be a combination of North and South, uh, but of course there's a, there's, a, there's a minimum level of regard that local context has to be given. Uh, oftentimes, of course, the, 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 the political leadership elected or technocrats could easily be impressed by, by the foreign uh, ideas, you know. Uh, so maybe uh, with this, I can, I can uh, sort of go back to uh, the panel for their response on, on, on these broad uh, observations uh, slash questions. Uh, Santiago, please. Um, so, so they are indeed very broad issues that, that you're moving forward. But uh, on the first point but by, uh, by William, so look, this this takes us a little bit out of, of, of the realm of research and, and, and north-south participation. But if you think that the world is moving from a bipolar, you know, China versus US and kind of caricature, and there are more countries in there that are matter, India, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, that are playing, this is, in my view, very welcome. This will enrich the policy debate, and this will naturally open up spaces from policymakers from these countries, meaning not the US, not China, and perhaps not Europe, to put their voice in the world. And their voice is being heard across in many issues, climate change, in, in, in macro policy, in development. And in my view, this is all to the better. And this is part of a, you know, a more balanced situation in which nobody calls all the shots and nobody has all the power. And we debate and we talk, and then you know, we somehow have to reach agreements. So, so I think that's good. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> but to come back and to sort of center the discussion a little bit on what, what Pep is trying to do, I, I do want to emphasize, because this is probably my last intervention, I do want to emphasize, I, I think there is substantial room for Pep to exercise leadership in talking to the multilateral development agencies, in talking to the public, to the journal publishers, in the way Pep itself carries on its own research, allocates research funds to first make sure that more people from the south participate this will improve the quality of the academic research because it will bring comparative advantages that people who don't know these countries don't have and also exercised by the allocation of funds a little bit more gender balance and a little bit of more opportunities for everybody and if pep can exercise in the years ahead leadership in this area I think its contribution to development, aside from what it's already been, would actually be very enriching and would put it in a leadership place. Uh, in about a minute, I'm going to have to apologize to everybody because I, I do have to run to, uh, to the airport. But if I don't have an opportunity again, thank you, Bagar. Thank you, Anna. And especially thank you to Jane and to everybody listening. Thank you, uh, Santiago. We understand that you have a flight to catch, uh, so safe travels. Uh, and maybe I can turn to Rose uh, for her uh, response to these questions. Yeah, um, I, I'll start uh, with the, the second one first, the one uh, uh, that is asking about uh, political leadership and um, uh, being convinced that uh, uh, the local content uh, 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 can support uh, uh, the policy uh, process. Um, I, I, I want to I want to look at this uh, from two angles, yeah, because I think uh, and giving examples again from Kenya, I think uh, because that is where I understand things uh, maybe maybe better. One of the things that we have seen uh, in our constitution, uh, Kenya constitution is uh, the opening up of what we call the public participation. Public participation is uh, where uh, everybody is called upon to make uh, their contribution uh, to a policy that the government is uh, putting up or to a law, a bill that is actually being discussed. 
So what happens is that uh, uh, anytime that's happening, uh, you can actually uh, make an, an input into it. Uh, any researcher with very good uh, findings, with very good uh, uh, policy advice, you can actually make uh, a participation in it. And of course, at the end of the day, they will be collected and uh, you may not, you may therefore find that uh, uh, probably you are maybe the only one or not the only one, and therefore that's how the things moved. And it's for this reason that uh, we found it uh, necessary to have actually a platform for think tanks, a platform where uh, today um, uh, it's not a, a, a think tank A, which is going to the government uh, to give uh, this kind of an advice. The next day is another one, the following day is another one, uh, such that at the end of the day, the policymaker even doesn't uh, get clear uh, direction on what uh, actually to take uh, uh, from the various visits. But if you have a good platform where you can have conversations on a certain uh, uh, element, I think that helps to say, uh, we have given you, we have deliberated, we have discussed, and probably this is what all of us are coming uh, 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 down with a solution. So uh, having such kind of platforms uh, becomes uh, very, very, very necessary. For the second one on uh, aspects to do with the uh, power structures and the like, I like what uh, uh, Santiago has, ha has provided, but I just want to add and say that uh, 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 enhancing uh, policy surveillance, uh, uh, I think is very crucial. Having systems that would help you to see the trends that are emerging are uh, very crucial because they make your work uh, uh, very relevant. Uh, when COVID came, we all went in. When Ukraine war is there, we all went in. Uh, of course, uh, I think even when the drought situation is coming in uh, in the Horn of Africa, we've also seen ourselves uh, getting into it to understand the, the situation. So uh, having uh, good mechanisms uh, that help you to track uh, what is happening, emerging issues, policy issues, what I call the policy surveillance, uh, helps you to actually be relevant and to move in uh, very quickly to uh, uh, address a certain policy issue. That's what I would, uh, I would say. Thank you, Rose, and uh, I turn to Rohinton. I think both the comments you flag are extremely important ones. And, and I'll start with uh, what I assume is Randy Spence. Um, the creation of the G20 as a manifestation of the new polarity is, I think, an important and perhaps a one of a once in a generation kind of shift in global governance that we're seeing. The fact that it does not have a permanent secretariat is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in the sense that the G20 is free to garner its information and analysis from anywhere it wishes. A not so good thing is typically then the bank and the fund and the DI is kind of muscled in and uh, play that de facto role. But what I find interesting after the early years is how the terms of the discussion and the frame of the discussion has been widening, although the G20 itself is arguably in drift. I think proposals that we've seen on global currency reform on international trade, on intellectual property reform, are precisely because of the gravity shifts that Randy uh, points to. Uh, it is important to understand that these happen because research communities in countries like China and India and Brazil and South Africa are strong enough to inform their policymakers and through them alter the world. But it still wouldn't get us anywhere, it would get us nowhere if China and India were not global players. So it's a two-part process. You have to have a strong domestic research environment, and then you have to have to be able to project that globally. Does that mean that the G20 is perfect or that the interests of small developing countries are being put forward by the large developing countries present in the G20? Of course not but rather that than the previous regime. And I should say that on things like intellectual property reform and currency reform, 
the positions being advanced by the developing countries in the G20 are actually quite defensible and quite broadly based, and I don't think they're self-interested. And so that leads me to that second point that you flagged, uh, Vakar, which is, what about national environments? And I think uh, the, the, the comment is a fair one. In many countries, the national environment is highly monopolistic, if you will, repressive politically, and I don't think there's any magic about Southern research. If Southern research is coming from countries that are highly undemocratic, highly socially unequal, then that's what it's going to reflect. So I come back to my original point. This is not about the provenance of the research. It's not about the citizenship of the author. It's about whether you can take a broadband view to the economics profession whether you can rigorously, as Isabella Weber uh, has done, project views that are off the mainstream and still hold your own. Thank you, uh, uh, Rohinton. Uh, let me uh, now uh, turn to the second round of uh, questions uh, which have appeared on the chat. I, 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 I do see a lot of interest in finding out whether uh, there are funds to promote uh, Southern participation. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, our panel will have a response to it. But I think uh, somebody also mentioned in the chat that what role the universities in the South or, or governments in the South can do. So I think this, this, this question of funding to promote uh, Southern participation can also uh, start uh, uh, from the South. Uh, this is also uh, uh, a, a reminder that there, there are large uh, R&D budgets uh, in the South, which could also be channeled uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, uh, maybe uh, in the interest of time and given that there's a lot of interest, we are, we are receiving a lot of questions, I could also bring in one question on data. Um, so we have Mariam here who has pointed out that uh, the first step in promoting gender equality in the, uh, in, in the production of reliable sex uh, disaggregated data is important. And uh, unless you have reliable sex disaggregated data, uh, uh, you won't be able to actually prove if the needle is moving uh, on the subject. Uh, uh, so, 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 so with this, back to uh, our, our panel, uh, maybe I could go in the reverse order, Rohinton. Um, you all, of course, would know this better than I do. Those of you that are affiliated with Southern-based think tanks and universities, how often do you receive a request from someone in the North saying, will you join me as a partner in this because it's a condition of this EU or AID or whatever fund, IDRC fund, uh, that I have a Southern partner. And you probably you know, have to think about that one. Is, is this a real partnership or are they bringing me on because I'm in the South and they need that for their application? Uh, and then I think that's a real dilemma is if we make a fetish of these partnerships, we will create fetishized partnerships and artificial partnerships. The trick is to create organic ones. And this is why, and I'm not saying this because I'm in a PEP seminar, this is why I think having Southern-based networks like PEP and GDN and ERC and ERF, there's about five or six of these that we should be proud of, are important because they have given credibility to Southern-based rigorous economic policy research. The other thing I'd say when one gets these kinds of requests is um, even if you have your doubts, my sense would be join. Join so that you show that you can make a difference, that you may have been asked to join for the wrong reasons. But once you join, you have shown your value. And I think it may be a frustrating way to operate, but I think mandating uh, North-South partnerships only goes so far. But if that's how we're going to go, then let's make sure that the Southern researchers who join have um, all the right tools and do it all the right way. And so 
it's incumbent, incumbent on funders to make sure that the partnerships that they're mandating are actually run on equal terms and are run in a way that would pass that spell test. On data, uh, we keep coming back to him, and, and I take the point. I think what would be, you know, before coming on the seminar, one thing I wanted to look at is what kind of data exists for, for the point I was making about civil service uh, reform. What kind of data exists on uh, the breakdown of the civil service in different countries? And frankly, I found very little. I mean, if you want a really good breakdown by eth ethnic background, gender, on, say, the composition of the public service in country X, in Canada, Statistics Canada has some, some countries report public service employment that way. But there isn't really, on the OECD website, there's very little at all. There's really very little taxonomy. Uh, there's very little by way of creating a standard for this kind of disaggregated data. And I think it would be a very good thing for a group of developing countries or networks like them to actually initiate a project that's actually quite boring, but hugely important because it's a public good. And that is to create norms and standards, almost like a template for different sets of data. I, I used the example of public employment, but it can be on any number of a dozen or more data categories where you say, what would constitute a good deep data set? So it's disaggregation by gender, region, ethnicity, what, what is it and why? And I think that kind of normalization, uh, which could then be kind of become the norm by partnerships between statistical agencies in developing countries could become a global standard. And I think that's the way we need to go. Thank you. Uh, Rose, uh, would you like to come in here? Yeah, um, I think uh, uh, Rohinta said uh, almost everything. Uh, so just add uh, a little and say that um, uh, when it comes to uh, 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 funding, and, and you mentioned also about the R&D, um, if, if you come to the African region, uh, there is that you know, a great commitment that uh, uh, we put about 2% of GDP to R&D, but very, very few uh, actually are doing that. Even in Kenya, we are still less than 1% uh, uh, of uh, GDP in terms of R&D. Uh, there are some structures that have been uh, put up uh, actually to see whether you can mobilize uh, some of these resources. Uh, like uh, we have the National uh, Research Fund, but uh, the amount of money that is there is, uh, is not enough for, for, for everybody uh, to, to tap into. Uh, and therefore, if such channels uh, can actually be utilized to uh, build up uh, the 2% that is required for R&D and support from the government, I think that would, uh, would take uh, uh, us very far. Because uh, in some situations, uh, some think tanks, uh, what they, they really suffer from is uh, a situation where you are not stable as far as your funding is concerned. And when you get funding, it keeps on derailing you from uh, uh, the objective or the, the, the area that we really wanted to, to cover. And therefore, you're not able actually to deepen yourself in terms of uh, uh, even building that skill that, that was required for, for the institution. Um, I, I'm happy that uh, uh, Rohinto has talked about uh, ARC. ARC has built uh, many of us actually in the region uh, in terms of our skills. And we also are very happy on the work that uh, uh, PEP is also doing with the, in the region, uh, both to nurture the, the, young, the young people, uh, because the young people, what they are looking for is actually uh, just small funding that they can do a project. And from it, they are able to learn and then they can move, they can move forward. Um, uh, but that say the uh, institutions uh, uh, our government can also set up institutions, uh, even like, like KIPRA. KIPRA is funded actually by the government. And uh, what that gives uh, KIPRA is uh, uh, the political will. And uh, uh, with that political will, then it makes it easier uh, for think tankers actually to network very easily uh, with the government. Um, uh, I think I want to stop there. A lot has been said by Rohinto, yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Rose. And uh, I'm going to pass it on to my co-moderator, Anna. And I'm sure that we are now approaching the end of this uh, meeting. Uh, uh, but Anna, I'm sure you'll have questions on your end uh, as well. Um, yeah, uh, there are some questions here uh, in two or three in the same topic that I would like to uh, ask the, the panelists to respond, which is related to some uh, obstacles that uh, researchers from the South have. And we, we actually study some of this in, the, in our research and we have actually a working paper on that, a PEP working paper. But the idea is that uh, it's known that in the global South, there is a high teaching load uh, sometimes uh, researchers cannot work much because of their teaching loads. They have low salaries. They have uh, uh, actually somebody just said here publications incentives that promote quantity over quality. So all these obstacles, of course, uh, has a lot of bad influence in, in, in the researchers participating in the discussions, in policies and publications. So what to do? I would like to pass to the panelists on ideas to, to decrease the structural barriers uh, related to infrastructure, to the funding and, and, and all that, that I just said. Thank you so much. Uh, would you like to start, Rose? Okay. Um... Yes, I can begin uh, with this, uh, the idea of um, uh, researchers and the, the obstacles uh, uh, that sometimes uh, uh, they face. Um, as I've indicated, uh, one of the things that uh, any uh, researcher would want to see is, uh, uh, in addition to publication, is that uh, whatever they are doing is actually uh, making an input into the uh, into the development uh, uh, agenda debate. Uh, but what happens is that uh, there are sometimes very weak networks yeah? uh, that uh, would help you to actually uh, find, your, find yourself uh, 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 with that, without a, a good networking. And I think if you are able, for example, even for uh, an institution like PEP, uh, to build up a very good, uh, strong uh, research ecosystem, which is uh, bringing together the young, uh, the seasoned, uh, the policy makers, uh, and they are able to actually digest uh, the kind of uh, research questions that are a priority. Uh, uh, then in that ecosystem, uh, I think uh, one would find uh, themselves synergizing because I think synergies are, are, are very crucial so that you don't do research uh, like you are just uh, ticking a box. Uh, I'm doing it because uh, I need promotion, whether it's quality or not quality, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, with that synergy, uh, where you are all uh, together and uh, looking at things uh, uh, from all perspectives, yeah, I think that would help uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that there is growth uh, for the researchers, and they are also able to network, and that way they can retool themselves, and they can also learn from each other, and they can strengthen themselves uh, uh, from just uh, focusing on their own uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, in the university, uh, the kind of uh, conditions that are, that are set there. So you'll do more work, not, not thinking about just the promotion, but you'll do more work are thinking about the contribution that you'd be making to the development agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Oh, I, I agree, Rose. Uh, I think um, the network effect and the effect of being together actually stimulates production and, and allows an exchange of views and creates the space for really good people who are in otherwise poor home environments to make a difference jointly. And that's the essence of networks like PEP and you two mentioned the ERC and so on. The other thing, and it's a practical one, and I, I, I think mostly it's done, but if it isn't, I'd encourage more of it, is that when uh, the network or whoever the funder is funds research, 
since one of the issues mentioned was high teaching loads, um, you know, course buyouts, uh, some, at least when I used to work at IDRCs, I found it was applied differently. Some agencies were okay with that. Other agencies did not encourage course buyouts because effectively it distracts you from your institutional responsibilities and you have well-funded faculty who never teach a course for years and years because they keep getting course by. I get that, but we have to find that right balance. Uh, and, and really the, the way to do this, uh, as I said earlier, is by working on the incentive structure in universities. Maybe we should be in addition to creating the space for researchers that you Rose mentioned, think about bringing university deans or university administrators together to say, you know, is, is this really what you want? Is this really what you want? Quantity over quality. Uh, and, and generate those discussions about uh, higher education, which actually have, are probably happening in countries. But again, I'm not sure there's that exchange of views and a best practice emerging. And in a region like Sub-Saharan Africa, where there are some well-established uh, nodes where universities come together, it would be a very good thing to do. Um, final point, increasingly, as the caliber of universities improves almost across the board in the South, my sense, and it's only an impression, is that this question of creating the wrong incentives is actually improving, that um, class sizes might not be going down, but how to assess a good faculty member is something that a good university rising in the global rankings, but located in a developing country, would kind of get. And I think we need to keep encouraging that phenomenon, not in all universities, because we'll never be able to do that, but select the best 20, 50, or 100 universities in the global south, and then work with them on setting a benchmark that may be even better than what we think the current best practice is in the north. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bakar, should we uh, finish or we have time for more questions? Maybe just one more question, I think, which uh, uh, Ethan had pointed out. I know that uh, we are okay. running close to our uh, end time, uh, but I think uh, it was an important observation that uh, researchers from the South continue to face some structural barriers uh, in, in ensuring their participation as well. I know that PEP has had uh, other webinars as well on this subject, which, which are already online, you know, uh, but, but the identification of these structural barriers is, is probably out there, uh, but the big push that is required to solve them, I think that that still requires uh, a lot of effort. And I think in his, in his comment, he does point about, about around those structural barriers such as uh, more resources required uh, for uh, integrating uh, uh, globally uh, uh, time incentives. Uh, and I, I understand at one point somebody had said visa issues in engaging with, for example, the Northern counterparts. So I don't know, maybe at the very end, if our panelists also want to uh, touch upon uh, any of the structural barriers or, or, or if there are solutions out there which, which networks and platforms have proposed. So it's, it's an open question to maybe Rohinton or Rose. Let me just say, Vakar, that you've actually designed uh, a very good project for someone, be it PEP or anyone to take on. Structural barriers, everything from sort of visas to um, sabbatical conditions, on up uh, is, is something to think through. I, I don't think you could do it globally. I think it has to be done by region or sub-region or country, but it's one of those things. And we've talked about structural barriers almost throughout this past hour and a half, so I have nothing more to say on that. Rose, would you yeah, like to yeah. come in? Yeah, Please. I'll, I'll, I'll just say uh, um, uh, one just to emphasize on, uh, on, on one element, and that is uh, uh, what I see also the uh, paper doing is uh, is building capacity. Uh, sometimes the uh, uh, research skills are very low um, uh, with us, and uh, the effort that is being done to build capacity uh, so that you become uh, uh, very sharp in terms of uh, the work you are doing. 
I think it's very, very crucial to build a very good uh, uh, pool uh, that would uh, uh, actually see attract others and make sure that uh, you are uh, you, you are not necessarily depending from, from the north because uh, in the south that uh, uh, I would say that uh, we have an advantage the fact that uh, we have the first hand experience on the things that we do. Uh, so it's, it's always good that uh, we are able to tell the stories of what we experience uh, ourselves and so build the capacity. And I like what uh, Pepe is actually doing, uh, building capacity for the, for the young people in the region. Thank you, uh, Rose. Uh, and, and I can see uh, uh, Jane uh, back with us here. And, and I, was, I was wondering if uh, we can try one more time, if uh, uh, Jane can probably give us closing remarks maybe, uh, if, if the technology has been managed. <laughs> uh, thank you, let's see, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. excellent. Well, I, I, I for sure don't know what happened because you know we spoke at the beginning and then when it came to my turn, it uh, completely froze. I think for me, it's first just to say thank you. I think this has been a very engaging webinar. As you can see, the questions on the chat and on the Q&A, I know we've not done justice at answering all of them, but I would say all thanks to first to Vaka and Anna uh, for great moderation. I was to introduce you at the beginning. Actually, my work was just to welcome everyone and also to introduce you. So I attempted to do that in the chat, but just to tell everyone that Vaka and Anna are um, among our top research fellows. They were PEP researchers at some point, like me, and then graduated to uh, be PEP research fellows. And Anna particularly has been representing the research fellows in the PEP uh, corporate membership body for the last six years and she's uh, done together with Vaka and others a fantastic job. And also leading actually the work on uh, Southern uh, participation, Southern marginalization. So they are moderating what they really uh, know best as to how it works. I know there have been a lot of questions um, as to how even Pep brings up with Southern voice. And, and I guess that would be uh, something that we continue uh, debating upon and also working together. But above that, I also want to thank uh, most sincerely our panelists, uh, Rohinton, Santiago, Ed Rose. Uh, we had Hanan who could not turn up the last minute. She was taken ill, but uh, everyone agrees with me that uh, really this was very engaging. Uh, very topical, and it's like uh, one would almost think that they had exchanged notes because the discussion has flowed very well, yet everyone bringing in very rich perspectives uh, from um, different dimensions uh, who they work with. So I want to thank all of you uh, for this very engaging uh, webinar. And uh, of course, we look forward to continue interacting with you. Uh, as uh, you all know, uh, from our call to action, one of the uh, uh, um, activities that we have are the, 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 the webinars, which are actually uh, co-organized by our research fellows led by Anna Advaka. And so we'll be having um, more of this, uh, but uh, also going forward, we do produce uh, proceeding, proceedings from our webinars. And so be on the lookout in our website for the proceedings. Uh, though I know we also share th with them, uh, I mean them with anyone who registered for our webinar. So with that, I don't want to um, uh, take so much of your time. Thank you again. And um, uh, wishing everyone the best. I know it's uh, one of those webinars where Anna is traveling, Rohinton is traveling, Santiago is traveling, and they still braved it and uh, made uh, time to participate in this webinar. We don't take that for granted. So thank you everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, let's continue working together. I've written on the, on the Q&A several times because there are researchers who are asking how they, they can get engaged with PEP. The first um, opportunity is go to the web PEP site, register as a, as a member into the mailing list 
so that anytime we have opportunities, you'll be on our mailing list that you get to know about the, 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 the opportunities that we have and also opportunities from others. And in the process, you get a chance to get engaged in the network. Thank you very much. Um, over back maybe to the communication team. I don't know whether there's any other thing to say. Otherwise, Anna and Baka, back to you. I can see John has shared the, 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 the link to register on the website. And I want to recognize, I've seen other board members who are present. I've seen Carol, our chair was there, Arimaehu, I've seen you, and everyone else, we appreciate. And also some of our fathers, I've seen Mother Merese, and everyone else, thank you. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, our participants too, and our resource persons. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye, thank you. We will now close the event. The recording will be posted on our YouTube channel.